think the big number that really pops out here is the 25 percent volume decline globally since the month of April. I mean, you, obviously, the quarter showed you came from a good place, but give us some color as to what's actually happening right now around the world. Yeah, as I said, we, we started the year great. January and February were very strong. We were right at the top end of our growth algorithm, building off the momentum for the last few years. It was it was really a strong start to the year. And then we've seen a sequence of companies, uh, countries, uh, go into a very similar journey, uh, kind of getting initial cases, declines in footfall in the away from home channels, lockdowns coming, really steep declines in away from home channels a stock up phase at at home, and then a normalization and a stabilization. Um, that was mainly China in the back end in March. Uh, and now it's kind of global uh, uh, in April. There's, the, the vast majority of the world is in some form of lockdown. Uh, as they said on the intro, we, we, we have you know, half the business in at home in, in round numbers and half in a way. Uh, the global volumes trending minus 25. Most of that decline is coming from the away from home channels. Uh, so they're trending, uh, you know, close to 50. So it, it really is a tale of two cities. Uh, and, and we see the situation stable at the moment. Um, but there's a long way to go to normalization. What have you seen so far? And I know it's early days, James, since you have such a good global grasp in, in the countries that are ahead of the U.S. in terms of the infection curve and the reopening process. What have you seen and what have you learned? Yeah, I mean, one of the great benefits of the code system is our ability to be literally everywhere and to learn and pass those learnings around the world with what we're doing. And we're really focused on managing our way through the crisis, the months of the quarters, so that we emerge stronger, as, as Jim talked about, as we always have from a global crisis, uh, make sure we emerge stronger for the long term. Uh, and so we really are passing uh, uh, those learnings around uh, from the countries. Quite clearly, as we come out of the profound lockdown phase, we see that most countries are adopting some form of graduated reopening. The exact content of which stores and which channels and exactly how in phase one versus two versus three varies a little, but we see a lot of countries uh, erring towards the same sort of phased approach cautiously, and we're right at the beginning. I think it's too early to call. You can certainly see some countries out there in the world Japan has had to uh, lock down a little harder. Singapore uh, has had to go back more into a lockdown. Uh, so I think it, we, we have to adopt an approach where an expectation of phase and also to be cognizant that there could be steps backward in some countries as the virus flares uh, up again. So this is going to be a winding path. Uh, we're going to have to manage each country. We're going to move our learnings around as a cold system. Uh, we have crisis management in the DNA, and we are going to emerge stronger but each country is going to be a path, and we shouldn't assume that each step forward is permanent necessarily. You said you're thinking about the long term and, and how you're going to reemerge stronger. How do you think the consumer is going to reemerge? What sort of changes are in store when it comes to e-commerce, how we're buying, what we're buying, and, and how are you going to keep those consumers that may be stocking up right now on Diet Coke that never have before in the long term? Yeah, Diet Coke grew in the U.S. in the last few weeks of March quite well. So, you know, in the short term, people are absolutely going to move back to the true uh, tried and trusted brand, brands, including Diet Coke, uh, uh, the Coke brand, Coke Zero. You know, in the U.S., we've seen way more people have breakfast at home. So we've seen the, the sales of orange juice go up uh, in, the last, in the last few weeks of March as well. So you know, there are going to be some temporary effects as we go through the lockdown and into these graduated re reopenings where, where different brands and different packages and different channels are going to benefit. As I said, you know, that goes up, juice will come back, breakfast at home. Uh, in the long run, I, the, the big structural trends will, will reassert themselves. The beverage industry will grow. Consumers will want choice. There will be both a need uh, for some premiumization, some, 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 some luxury uh, in a way in some of the channels but also affordability in the others. There's no getting away from the fact that the crisis, uh, the health crisis and the lo necessary lockdowns is going to produce a negative economic effect that's going to be with us uh, for a while. And so there are going to be a significant portion of people with less disposable income looking for affordability, uh, looking to manage their income. So we 
uh, as a business system will have to uh, offer choice, not just of brands and categories, uh, but of packages and price points uh, to a wide range uh, of, of consumers going forward. And that, that will take some time to work its way through. How disruptive has it been to your plans in, in running the business? For instance, product delays, advertising spending. What's going to be different than what you had originally planned going into 2020? Most things are going to be different as it versus where we started the year, uh, given what's going to happen. You know, certainly on the advertising front, um, uh, we are, are very focused always on two things. The return on investment we believe we're going to get from the spend uh, and making sure the messaging for that brand uh, is not just on, uh, on, on in sync with the brand's positioning value, but in sync and, 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 and in tune with the consumer mood uh, with the right target. Uh, so actually, in the very short term, we have suspended uh, almost as much of the advertising as we possibly could if not already uh, committed, and, and we'll do so through most of the lockdown phase. Uh, then as we start to see some of the reopenings, we'll, we'll re-engage as, as we're starting uh, to look to do so uh, in China. Um, we're going to manage our marketing spend, not just cautiously from, cautiously from a financial point of view, making very sure we're investing where we can engage with consumers where it's worthwhile uh, to do so and, 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 and productive uh, as an idea. So there's a lot of focus on on managing uh, the markets. Then, then the supply chain, the supply chain teams have done a fantastic job, uh, the company and the bottlers around the world to keep uh, the system moving, um, uh, whether it's the, the, the plants or the logistics and, and the sourcing of the ingredients. There have been issues um, much longer supply lines in terms of time, uh, issues at borders taking much longer. I have to say it's better now than it was uh, two or three weeks ago. So we do have um, uh, our kind of global dashboard of all the plants and, uh, and all the logistics, and it's better than it was. Um, not that there are no issues, but they're really doing a great job of keeping the supply lines open. Uh, from the ability to source ingredients all the way through to deliver to customers. James, Jim. Hey, Jim. How are you? <laughs> April 2nd, 1993. It's a day called Marlboro Friday. It was a day when Marlboro realized they'd been raising price, raising price. They hit a level that was too far. And out of nowhere, they announced a 20% price cut and shocked the market. Uh, but the company recovered. Does uh, Coca-Cola have to have a Coca-Cola Monday? Um, I'm not sure I completely uh, but see the parallel, uh, but, but absolutely what is true is that every business, every business, uh, whether they're seeing growth the same or big declines in this new normal, uh, is going to have to think profoundly about what is going to reassert itself as the same as before, what is going to reassert itself that is new, and how do you get uh, through the coming quarters that are going to be very different. Uh, and we are the same. We, we absolutely are looking at how we do our marketing, how we do our innovation, how we do uh, our, our pricing and packaging, and how we execute with our bottlers uh, in the customer spaces uh, to, to drive the business. The right, well, Coca-Cola system has a lot of experience in crises over 134 years. And, and a used example of the Spanish, the Spanish flu, we have emerged from every crisis with a military, economic, or pandemic, and we've always been stronger afterwards than we were before, because the, the crisis management is in the DNA, and, and because we reconsider everything to make sure we not just manage the day to day, but emerge stronger from the crisis. And there's no doubt about it that you've got the best models, and you're right, the Marble Friday was really against the generics, but what I'm thinking about is, is that if we have the kind, let's say we have 30 million people unemployed, uh, they may actually trade down to some Coca-Cola equivalent that you and I would never drink. And you, you know I'm a Coke Zero fan. Uh, uh, I have never thought about going to a generic Zero fan. Uh, but maybe something happens with 30 million people unemployed. Maybe they say, I don't need branded. Could that happen? What we will definitively see is a lot of people with a, a lot less disposable income, and they will be more conscious of the price points that they spend their money on. And we as, a, we as a business system must respond uh, with price points that are more accessible for them. But we have a long history of doing so. And in certain parts of the world, that's going to mean a big push on refillable PET bottles. 
because um, you can get the price points down lower. Uh, we're going to look at small, smaller multi-packs, smaller packing. You know, we have to offer them the price points that are accessible to them. And, and you're absolutely right. There are going to be people with less money. And we will be more dedicated to making sure they have a Coca-Cola option uh, that's right for them. Right. Let's talk about dividends. A lot of people who uh, watch Mad Money, they watch it to find out what dividends I say are solid. Uh, here we got a severe test of Coca-Cola in months of April and, and March. Anything there that would make you feel like that, you know what, I've got to go to my board and say, hey, maybe we're paying too much of a dividend? Um, we are focused on, you know, managing the business. And we have very clear uh, a hierarchy of priorities, both in, you know, on every dimension, whether it's, you know, in trying to get job security. That's why, you know, we haven't done that big layoffs and the people we furloughed, we've pay, we furloughed on full pay. Uh, and so we have very clear that priority. Similarly, uh, with, the, with, with the shareholders, we have very clear uh, the, div, the, the importance of the dividend uh, relative to the share buybacks. We basically pulled out of doing share buybacks. We said we don't see much M&A coming. Uh, we understand the priority the shareholders uh, put on the dividend. Uh, of course, we're, we're continuing to invest sensibly uh, in the ongoing business. So for each stakeholder in the business, we have a very clear sense of prioritization of what's important to each group. Uh, and we are going to manage through uh, the quarters uh, with a view to the long term and emerging stronger and making sure we, we, we do what's right for each of the stakeholder groups. James, just trying to figure out consumer behavior, and you guys have such a good handle on it. You know, your home state or Coca-Cola's home state of Georgia has pretty ambitious plans to start reopening its economy on Friday for beauty salons and fitness centers and, and gyms and, and salons. On Monday, they're going to reopen movie theaters and restaurants. Do you think consumers will come? I think that you, you look, as you see, look at the reopenings, whether it's the one that's coming up in Georgia or some of the ones that have happened in Europe or all the way over to China, Singapore, uh, Japan and South Korea. Uh, we have been able to draw on our experience of what happens in each of those places. Clearly, you see there are groups of consumers uh, that when the, when the door is open, they'll come and re-engage with the world uh, uh, on, on, on those terms. Uh, there'll be some that will be more cautious. Then there are some that are going to, you know, have less, uh, less going to channels and locations where you congregate until they see more clearly the viruses, uh, the viruses dissipated. Um, so absolutely, I have no expectation there's going to be a snap uh, back to normal uh, on Friday or Monday morning. Um, each, each part of the world is trying to find a path to reopening, whether it's the the program that Georgia has, or it's you know what Germany and Austria have, uh, or what China and South Korea and Singapore. Do. Each each place is trying to find a way to have a phased, gradual reopening, uh, such that people can start to reactivate the economy without letting the virus take off. But there's no guarantee, and I think it's going to be have to be done phased and with mm -hmm. thought and effort, because you can already see, you know, Japan and Singapore have had to re-increase the level of lockdown uh, to contain um, uh, the virus again because uh, they've had slight uptick. So we, I think you'll see people be cautious because it'll be phased and there'll be some worries about secondary upticks. Is China really open for business as usual? What does it look like there? Uh, within China, I mean, there are, there are restrictions on traveling in and out, but it, Within the, within the within China, the business has has largely stabilized. We were doing great in January, good growth, really down uh, in February, and then volatile but slowly stabilizing through March, and it's kind of coming back uh, through neutral uh, into into April. Uh, so it's it's stabilized. The the country is open for business. We're doing similar amounts to we were. Uh, last year, we don't haven't recovered the levels of growth rate that we had before, but it is largely open, at least for the products that we're selling. Wanted to also ask you about raw material costs. I mean, we've seen this crazy drop in the price of oil and really across the board. Are you able to take advantage of that to lock any of those prices in now so that it will help you later managing cost? Wow, I wish I could lock in that uh, crazy oil price uh, forever, but I, I 
Look, uh, you know, we, we have a very uh, effective uh, uh, central procurement team that work for us and the bottling system uh, uh, and have done a great job in managing both the availability of commodities and capturing the benefit of price increases. Of course, we don't use oil directly. We largely use it to convert uh, uh, into resin. That's our biggest use of the oil. But whether it's oil uh, or any of the other commodities, to the extent we've been able uh, to capture the benefit of these lower prices, we'll, we, we bring it into our hedging and as, as, do the big, as do the bottling system. How are the bottling, bottling plants doing? Are, are they all open? Do they have the raw materials and the, the supply chains they need? And could you ever envision a situation where, where you'd have to essentially bail them out if they do run into some financial trouble? Virtually all of the bottling plants around the world are, are operational. Um, they can get the, the raw materials and the ingredients they need. Uh, the distribution systems are, are open. Uh, so the, the, we can supply the customers that are there. So the, all the bottlers are operational. <clears throat> Excuse me, obviously it depends exactly which your country, but all of the bottlers uh, are essentially uh, operational. Uh, and we've come into this crisis uh, with a super strong uh, set of bottlers. We spent a lot of time over the last number of years strengthening the bottling system. Half of it is in the hands of big public companies. They have strong, a well-capitalized balance sheet, good liquidity position. So they're coming into this crisis with a great financial position and really strong uh, executional capabilities in the marketplace. So I think they're in a really good place. Um, uh, and the other half of the system is small and medium-sized bottlers. Uh, and and, and, and you know, the vast majority of them are in a good place. Um, uh, and we'll work with, uh, over the course of this crisis, especially if it lasts uh, some extended period of time, if there are any issues in the system, but absolutely the starting point is we're in a really good place.